The Edifice Complex podcast is brought to you by DCM, the drawing specialists, Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software, and Sensor Suite, the future of intelligent buildings. Welcome to the Edifice Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts, Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean, keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work, perspective on the adjacent possible, and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here again with my colleague, official agitator, friend, and Yoda of most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, Sir Yoda. Hello. I like to think I'm like Baby Yoda nowadays, right? Like the Mandalorian. I wish I was Baby Yoda. <laughs> Adam, today's guest is a professional engineer, is a professional engineer, and uh, she has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Polytechnique Montreal, and her Master's in Building Engineering from Concordia University, both well-known schools. She is currently a uh, directrice de Raison Physique, and I think that's uh, the person in charge of buildings <laughs> at... Uh, College Le Cité, which is a yeah, it's a, co- a college in, in is that in Ottawa? Yes, it is. Yep, yes. it is. So, welcome to the show, Madame Lanchi Nagoyan Weeks. Well, thank you very much for having me. Great, uh, Lanchi. Um, I I can't read all the things that you've been involved in. I'm just going to read some of them because it's pretty impressive, right? You've been president of Ashray Ottawa chapter. Yeah. And also the Ottawa Region Chapter for the Canadian Green Building Council. You've been an editor of Recognition and Evaluation of Control of Indoor Mold Book, which is uh, published by the American Industrial Hygiene Association. You've been chair of its Indoor Environmental Quality Committee. You've been secretary and chair for the Green Building uh, Working Group of that organization. Of course, you're heavily involved in ASHRAE, member of uh, the ASHRAE Minimizing Indoor Mold Problems Through Management of Moisture and Building Systems. Uh, it's a position document that the ASHRAE have published. You're also current chair of TC2 uh, 1.2 uh, Moisture Management Building and vice chair of the Environmental Health Committee. Lanchi, you've managed to squeeze 30 hours out of 24. <laughs> I don't sleep. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Tell, tell our listeners how, how you've managed to warp time and how did you get to where you are today? Well, um, you know, at, at my parents were, were immigrants. So, you know, they, they went to Quebec at the time because they thought that was a good thing. Uh, they, they speak French, so, uh, but they really didn't really factor in the snow factor there and the cold factor coming from a, from a warm country. So um, I grew up in Quebec, uh, did my degrees in French and, uh, you know, learned to speak French like a good Quebecois. Uh, and then um, I had the opportunity to move to Ottawa to work for the federal government and, you uh, you know, the rest is history. It's all this stuff that you were talking about. Yeah, you know, we look at our forefathers, and uh, mine came from uh, the UK, so Scotland and England, and I often tell the stories that they weren't that smart. I, at least I didn't think they were that smart because they could have gone to mm, the Caymans, uh, mm-hmm. Bahamas, <laughs> uh, Florida. <laughs> yeah. You know, they could have gone to Australia, but they chose Northern Saskatchewan. <laughs> and for yeah. those of you that maybe don't know where Saskatchewan is, just take a map of Canada and take the middle of the country, go north, and it's one of the coldest places on the, on the planet. But then I started thinking here with climate changes of consequence, well, maybe they weren't that stupid. <laughs> That's right. It just took a hundred years for it to kind of sink in, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so you, now, you know, I, I volunteer throughout the years because I had the opportunity to, but I wanted to because I was curious about all these people doing different things. And it's been great over the year. I've been more than happy to be involved. And, uh, you know, I own my own company, too, for 22 years doing consulting work and doing research, apply research. And, and eventually I had enough of that and I became director of physical, uh, physical resource, you know, for a college. 
a French college, nonetheless, in an English province. So um, <laughs> it's interesting. You know, I work in French all day long, and then I go home and try to translate in my head what's going on in English. So, yeah, that's the day. Uh, well, it's been, it's been interesting because I think out of one of the things that you have that a lot of engineers don't have is not only do you have the academic experience and working with researchers and developing policy and codes and standards, yeah. but you also are a, a practitioner too yes. in the application of the knowledge, and not only in terms of new buildings, but also existing structures. And that mm -hmm. makes you a pretty unique person. Well, I hope so. That's why would they pay me the big bucks, right? <laughs> Finally, Adam, we found an engineer that's making big bucks. <laughs> Ching. <laughs> Ching. <laughs> we it's cheaper to hire me than to hire me as a consultant, you know? I mean, you should be earning big money. You're making me feel quite lazy. I felt quite shabby here in your, all your work, <laughs> the committee work read out. So... You really have, you're, you're like the uh, sort of like perfect Canadian immigrant, right? You come here, you speak French and English, you reinvent, your family reinvents themselves. This is like, there should be a TV advert for this. Come to Canada, you can do this. this, this I, I don't want, I want, a, I want my own TV show, okay? And, uh, if it was up to me. <laughs> so uh, what I'm interested in, a couple of things, really. One is, what's it like, first off, let's start with your current job. So you're director of, uh, if I was in Lebanon, they could say director of physical plant and resources, right? Yes. Um, and so what's that like? Because uh, I, I deal with a lot of French-speaking people when I do work in, uh, in Lebanon, and the director of physical plant and resources is quite a prestigious job and quite powerful within uh, AUB, the American University there, where I do a lot of work. And, um, but it's a very male world. It's a lot of male people there. And it's a, I'm trying to think if I know of any ladies in that role or around that role. I don't. So what's that like? It's fine. They work yeah. on me, so I don't care. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, right? Yeah. You fire the same way as anybody else. <laughs> <You're done. laughs> <laughs> it just worked for me, so it's fine. Um, no, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's an interesting job because of, of my background, especially with COVID also, you know, they, they put me in charge of making sure that all the um, environmental hygiene measures are being in place. So, and, and the fact that I understand ventilation and the impact oh. of ventilation on, on um, uh, you know, virus, uh, and, and so on. So that's been good. We have been work in indoor air quality and so on. But also the fact that meanwhile, uh, you know, building has to be maintained. You can't just close down a building and expect that everything's going to be fine. Um, and uh, and thinking ahead also as, as you know, defending my position, I have to think ahead what, what's going to be the new after. Like what, what's going to happen to all the space that I have? Um, you know, do I need to replace the ventilation system? Do I need to improve the filtration system that we have? Not only because uh, like any university and colleges, you're there for the next 100 years, you know? So, so the thinking scale is much longer than, well, you know, it doesn't matter if it's fine for the next three years or so. You're thinking in terms of 25 years or 50 years. So what, what is the pandemic going to be? Are there going to be more pandemics? Or is like, how are we going to be resilient with climate change and everything? So it's not a matter of just renewable, renewing the resource. You have to uh, almost peer in the crystal ball and say, you know, what's the, what's the worst case scenario that we're going to be faced and how are we going to take care of that? Oh, I'm so really glad. Sorry, yeah. Man. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, Lanchi, because we're yeah. trying to get people to understand, you know, uh, within the circle that I work in, and there's about 50 of us around the world, different professions. We have epidemiologists that are working on our team. We have virologists. We have physicians. We have economists. We have lawyers. We have engineers. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to understand is that Vaccines are good, but it's like whack-a-mole, you know? If you can't get your buildings prepared for not uh, fix them for this pandemic, but future pandemics, the vaccines aren't going to help us, you know, in terms of transmission rates. We need to get our architecture and our mechanical systems 
set up anticipating that this isn't the first time, it's not the last time. And as viruses come and go, we can develop vaccines and that will deal with that particular one. But my God, if we at this time don't get our buildings fixed, this go around, we're, well, I want to use a expletive deleted, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, and, and again, nobody has money uh, to put in a system that is going to be questioned two years down the road. This system, uh, you know, supposedly lasts for 20 years. We are on the 30 year cycle now and God forbid that, you know, we're not going to get money to replace them on, for another 10 years because we are a public, um, you know, we are, we are public servants, basically. We are a public service. So you have to be very careful with the money that you have and, and how you plan for the future, not just, you know, we're going to save now. Well, that's nice, but it's not going to last you 25 years. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting because I do a lot of work with universities and like the campus model, the whole long-term thinking. I mean, basically everything's done on a life cycle analysis, right? 20-year yeah. life cycle of a plant, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But going back to your original point, there were so many good things to unpack there. So there's like the long-term view, right? Yeah. Which, you know, if you're in the speculative building business, forget that. So you're, you're unique already. Right. But then you've, you said, you know, do we have to upgrade the plant and do we have to change filtration? What else is that, in my opinion, is yes and yes. Right. So this is sort of like a, a black swan event, if you like. So, well, <laughs> some people would say no. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you've, you've got this 20 year life cycle plan, you're, you're budgeting, you your money, you manage your money. All of a sudden you've got this out of left field event. So, yeah. That involves a capital injection, right? And a rethink about how you do things. How does that happen? At, you know, is, is there politics involved in that? Or do you go to private funding? Or uh, There's lots of politics, really. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think that I have a really good relationship with, with my VP finance. And, and we understand each other. So, you know, the, the honest truth is, is, is the cost of risk. What's yes. the cost of risk? And, and we always work on that. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, so how much is a lawsuit going to cost you or how much, you know, yes. uh, reacting costs you as uh, versus being proactive. And, and that beats, that works every time. Look, if you <laughs> was in the room of heartless lawyers, they would say to you, how much does a young person's life cost? What will we have to pay? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, so, so that's how we, we justify a lot of what we do. Uh, you know, and, and we committed to providing a, a good environment for, for learning. So obviously that's part of that. And you're right. I mean, you have to justify, you have to figure out a way so that accountants understand what you're babbling about, right? I mean, how much is it going to cost me, right? Well, no, it's, it's going to cost you even more than this if you yeah. don't do this. Oh, okay. Uh, the insurance are not going to cover you anymore. If you're going to have another flood event uh, because you didn't plan for it. Oh, oh, that I understand, right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you have to almost translate it into their language. And, and for them, it's the cost of risk. So that's interesting. The insurance angle, I, I've always been thinking lately that that's the angle to go, right? Yeah. So let's say, and in my opinion, you know, there needs to be a real rethink about, let's just take, schools and colleges and universities yeah. right how they're ventilated in terms of safety and delivering indoor air quality and actually meeting building code ventilation rates because none of them do let's be straight right yeah. so if that becomes an insurance risk item the money can appear at that point right because people get sued or people get shut down that's what needs to happen that's how significant this event is in my opinion I would love to see the building code change so that, I don't know, dedicated outside air systems with uh, heat recovery, a really basic code for yeah. public buildings, right? With MERF 13 filters and UV. I got into a nerd rap battle with someone on, uh, on um, LinkedIn the other day. So some politician in uh, New Zealand said, we have to stop staying at these hotels with subpar ventilation. So things like that drive me nuts because... Yeah. that's performative political bullshit right yeah. subpar what does that mean should what does that mean could i should be a billionaire and married to beyonce i'm not right <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at Chief Smith and Adam. 
Oh, when, she doesn't even know. She has no yeah. clue what she's missing. If only she knew. But <laughs> should, could, subpar, all these things that are nebulous, bullshit stuff, right? What we have to say is yeah. the cost of not doing this is modeled out of X lives of people below 25. Their lifetime potential earnings are X million. Therefore, we either pay that out in a lawsuit or we insure it and then we fix it, right? And, and if you have a good relationship with, with an accountant, uh, what it does is it allows you not necessarily to go and borrow money too much. Uh, yeah. so, so you don't have to go and get financing. Uh, if you explain to your boss that, you know, they're hedging their bets here. So if they say you're going to save $500,000 in energy, really, you should be able to save 800000 but they just want to be on the safe side. So that kind of numbering, you know, they understand. Yeah. They say, oh, well, if that's the case, I can borrow my own money. <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't need to have somebody else lend me the money. So um, it, I think it's the relationship and how you have the conversation is to explain it in the language they understand. Yeah. yeah, there are so many things here. I just like this conversation has got me pumped up here. Um, and I and you know what, hey, Lanchi, you're gonna have to forgive us because when Adam and I get this enthusiastic about a discussion, this is gonna bounce around. <laughs> That's, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Nowhere else to go. Come on. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked a question, you know, a, a pretty blunt one, and that was, is that in a life death scenario like a pandemic? Yeah. Those that are creating minimum requirements, in fact, should they be the authority? Now, that was one question I want you to think about. And then the second thing is when you look at the code in Canada, our codes are written to minimize risk of illness. That's the, that's the short strokes, right? Yeah. So the codes are there to, to minimize risk of illness. And we have people who are the authority writing those minimum requirements that clearly are not competent. <laughs> they don't have the capabilities to, to, to do what is necessary. So when it comes to risk assessment, I mean, how do we, going forward, are minimums enough? So we, we're talking about a continuum, planning for the next 25, 50 years, and however many pandemics that, that represents. Are the minimums enough, and do we have the right people in charge to recognize that they're not? Well, first of all, I think the co people are about 10 years behind on the latest data. So that's first thing. So what is minimum when you're 10 years behind? Right. So that's one uh, thing. Good question. Right. So, uh, well, from what I can see anyway, uh, they're 10 years behind. Never mind that when you talk about new material and, and, you know, green material, they have no idea of what you're talking about because they haven't got there yet. So I think that's that's one thing. I think the other thing is, um, and, and we talk about that also, why are we accepting minimum standard when would you accept that, oh, it's, you know, the, the surgeon that has passed who's going to operate on your brain, not the best, the one that have passed, yeah. right? right. So, so what are we breathing? What are we ingesting? Would you accept that? it's good enough or are you going to accept if I can buy for the best, I will buy for the best. Yeah. And we have, and that applies to anything, waterborne, airborne, foodborne, anything, anything that the human is exposed to, yes. you know, we're talking about health. And so that brings up another thing, you know, in terms of health and safety, like what kind of, I mean, we have not yet used the, the, the courts, the, our laws, in our on our continent in the united states or canada and even those in the uk anywhere where sort of i guess orthodox race has existed we haven't tested the laws yet health and safety laws labor laws corporate laws civil laws and then of course criminal laws you know these things i'm i'm convinced that until we start to apply the laws and start to test them in this pandemic against people who are have basically ignored their ethics as professionals that are we going to learn anything out of this i think that maybe some of us will not all of us um i have to tell you one of the a story i have i have to tell you this because that was very disheartening 
so I was dealing with with uh, some people, and I'm going to give you too much details because it's going to show, it's going to tell you immediately who they were. But anyway, they were in position of power, right? And they were going to make decision about what the college is going to do. So I said to them, well, you understand that we ventilate, right? And this is what we're doing in terms of ventilation, uh, as opposed to PPE, because they keep harping about PPE. Oh, PPE, we don't have enough PPE, and people were not wearing proper equipment, blah, blah, blah. You know that we're ventilating. You know that I have a software that can calculate the risk based on the efficiency of your mask and the ventilation that I'm putting in this room, right? And they look at me and they say, we don't understand anything of ventilation, so we're going to ignore that. And I say, what? <laughs> you are people who make decisions and you don't know. Go and get informed. Yes. It's not because you don't know that it doesn't exist. In the yeah. hierarchy of control, ventilation, prime over personal protective equipment, right? So if you ignore ventilation and keep harping about personal equipment because you don't know anything about ventilation, that's not good enough. And yeah. they drop on the floor and I'm like, I'm not backing down on this. You don't know enough to make the kind of decision you're making. Go and get informed. Yeah, I'm good for you. Because, you know, and, and apparently they were like, oh gosh, no, look, I take my, my profession very seriously. You know, we all do. And to, I, I'm insulted when somebody say, I don't know anything about it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> I that got tingles on a politician. <laughs> absolutely. I got tingles on my spine when you say that kind of stuff because you're absolutely right. People don't know that our the, an obligation of a professional engineer or a technologist, anybody, an architect, interior design, the number one is the health and safety of the people that we're responsible for in our buildings. That means as soon as they step inside of our buildings, they're our responsibility. And we work with the tools that we have, our understanding of physics and chemistry, building materials, airflow, all of these things, that's our area. Um, but we're not so arrogant and narcissistic like a lot of other professions that we don't I mean, we know there's a role for the epidemiologist. We know there's a role for the biologist and the industrial hygienist. All of these people need to come together in an integrated team. But these, there are some people out there outside of our profession that is like, nope. Yeah. If it doesn't, if if it doesn't sit inside my helmet, my space shield, it doesn't matter. You know. Yeah, I'm like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am glad to hear you say that. That's. It's about incentives though, right? So license, one, what, you're right. People don't understand licensing really was about health and safety originally, right? And then Absolutely. the competence yeah. to ensure that. So licensing is also about accountability. So yeah. until someone does a perp walk and loses their license over a poorly ventilated system, yeah. right? every professional engineer that signs off on a VAV system in an office yeah. knows that the minimum outside air in the mid range is never going to be there, which means that building does not meet building code for ventilation. The consequences are zero for that. Yeah. So life is about incentives and disincentives, right? Yeah. And accountability. Yeah. And until there is, and this is unfortunately the argument for lawyers, until there's a, a sharky lawyer comes in and sues an engineer and gets that person unlicensed, everyone's just going to carry on doing what they're doing, right? Because it's... Yeah, having the minimum doesn't yeah. help either. You no. know, having a minimum yeah. standard is not helping because you're just lowering the bar for, you know. So, so I don't know. I mean, I always find it really interesting to live on the minimum standard. You know, from a hygiene, industrial hygiene point of view, you go with the stricted rules. If there are competing yeah. rules and you're not sure which one should apply, you go with the stricter one just because you, you err on the side of caution. You know, yeah. if it looks too strict, that's too bad. But at least, you know, I took the best decision I could take and I protect you as best as I could. I don't see why we're not doing that because ventilation, if you look again in the hierarchy of control, prime above personal protection equipment. Yeah. yeah. But it's ventilation, HVAC is the, uh, the game of no consequences, right? 
Yeah. The HVAC guy, happy. girl screws up, someone gets hot, someone gets cold, you know, the PPMs go up a bit, no one dies till now. Yeah. If you're the structural guy and you yeah. screw up and something falls down, big consequences, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you then, know. And, sorry, Alan, I got me going here. I was well, not <laughs> We've been talking about this all day. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's and there's so there's a there's a there's an axiom here developing. There's a principle, and that is is that the minimums become maximum. And it doesn't matter if you're in the healthcare profession or the building sciences, whatever. If we set the minimums, industry, society will treat that as the maximum. And that's why the pandemic is continuing to spread because the minimum healthcare requirements for PPE and building ventilation, all these types of things are treated as nothing more than the minimum. What, if anything beyond that is not in the budget or it doesn't matter, it doesn't work, it's not inside my space helmet, <laughs> right? What, what, so from a solutions point of view, how do you feel about a performance-based building code, not prescriptive code? Well, um, I, you know, I think that performance is something interesting because it was involved with the performance-based um, project. And I have to say that, uh, you know, the, the responsibility on the builder side, uh, yeah. you, you have to uh, get them into the game also because they operate on the minimum performance. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I, it doesn't matter unless you write this airtight, which it never can be done, right? You can never write a, 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 an airtight specification. You have to work with somebody who has that same mindset because otherwise they're gonna say, well, you told me to do this, I've done it. You know, it, it, it's the minimum of what we told you because we didn't caught this and you're doing the minimum. You have to find somebody who's willing to go the extra mile. And I have yet to find a contractor that's willing to go that extra mile, even if it's going to cost them, I don't know, because they, they work on the low price also, um, that's going to cost them, but they're going to deliver a better product, right? Oh. And, and I think we have to change that game of, um, you know, at the college, we have a policy that we're not necessarily taking the lowest price because uh, if it doesn't do what we want it to do, it doesn't give us what we needed to do. We're not taking the lowest price. So there's no incentive to bid on the lowest price. The, the because I think that's, with the, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, so so I think that's where the yeah. difficulty is. It's if you if you expect if you expect it you pay you get what you pay for. Yeah, I mean the problem for all contracting, everywhere I've worked in the world, and I've worked in 21 countries, is if your contractor the only thing you're incentivized to do is cut corners and cut costs. Yeah. That's the only way you get paid, right? Yeah. So if I was, say, you know, king of your university, putting out a contract, the way I would hold the account, the contractor accountable, I'd say, okay, design and build, just say it's design and build, just to keep all the liability in one box for a minute, right? Design and build contractor, you're going to design this and the air leakage rate through this structure is going to be X or Y or better. If it's not, you pay me. Yeah. Like mafia style, right? Pay yeah. me, boy, right? And you're going to, the temperature range is going to be this, and we're going to monitor it for a year. If you go out of range, your fine is this, this, and this. There should be a penalty because yeah. I think that's that's the thing. Um, the difficulty that I have is that once they disappear, try to get them back. Oh, yeah, you've got to hold their money. So you got to, this is, again, the accounting thing, right? Yeah. I'm a big fan of project accounts where the money is put in escrow and yeah. it's taken out by, by, by a third party, like a child surveyor might value it. And then there are um, fine. There's, a, there's what's called a pool of fines and incentives, right? You beat this benchmark, the incentive money comes out, right? And if you don't, you 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 part of your contract is you pay back into that fund and if you don't you can be sued yeah. right and and you know i think that the way we construct is is really problematic also because um i heard at one of these building science uh, uh meeting that the, the 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 lifespan of the building is 18 years what the heck you know like what yeah. Uh, you know, you have buildings that, you know, we have in town that last for a hundred years. And I'm sure at the time they were like, this is way expensive. 
But that thing is still standing and working, right? We think the short terms and it's not getting us anywhere in terms of saying to these people, you have to build really cheap and it's fine, you know, but really you can, uh, six months within, look, my new building, which, you know, has been signed before I get to the college, the bathroom leaked seven times, seven times. I'm like, rip it all off and redo it. Yeah. Because so, there's no way that within six months, it's leaking seven times. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, that's crazy. So where I come from, that would be called a latent defect. So one of the things I found when I moved here, right, in Canadian, Canadian uh, contractual law, which tells you who pays who in the government, right? After 12 months, a contractor can walk away from that building and 12 months plus one day, if that thing falls down, no consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the UK, there's a 12 months defects liability period and a 12 year latent defect period. Ah, there you so go. So you're on the hook for 12 years. Yeah. Right? <laughs> now, I assume that was everywhere, like an idiot. I come here and I assume that's the case. No, no, no. 12 year and one day, man, yeah, that thing can it. fall down. Go out of there, right? Yeah. So, so I think that that's the thing that we, we have to, you know, engineers are liable for, for at least 10 years on, on some of the, yeah, you know, some of the drawings and what everything. A contractor should be too, you know, yeah, like anybody involved should be too. Engineers get away with murder here because they, well, t tell me the last time an engineer got delisted. You've got to be a crack whore. You've got to be a pedophile. And you've really got to screw up on your calculations before they take your license off you. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure it's safe. Terry, you would you uh, list a few people, you know. You know, but, but part of that has to do with one of the, one of the obligations of a professional is when you see one of your you know, sorority or fraternity members not behaving properly, you need to report it. Absolutely. It's, so part so part of, you know, if there's if there is wide scale abuse going on, well that's says something about the individual and his or her characteristic, but it also says a lot about the people that have to play in that field. If they're not saying anything, that makes them just as guilty. Yeah. 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 You know, and yeah. And we know here in Alberta, like when I was a member of APEGA, every month we'd get the publication and it had who's been good and who's been naughty and nice. It was like Santa Claus. <laughs> so it's the most wanted. <laughs> yes, we have that too, you know. Yeah, you know, every it would come and you would see the people that were getting their hands slapped and some of it was, you know, some of it was negligence, but some of it was outright fraud and... Mm -hmm. Just, you know, people stealing other people's stamps and faking someone's signature on a drawing. I mean, that kind of stuff was shocking. But you know what? No profession is immune. But it, we have to say that, you know, fortunately, that, you know, a high percentage, likely over 95% of all professionals behave, I think. Would you agree with that? You think? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I know I behave. <laughs> That's all what I can say. I know, I know, I know. You know, when you think about it, right? Look, what's a loss of license worth the risk, right? I know, you know, I remember early on in my career, we were working on a district energy project in uh, Eastern Canada. I want to kind of say exactly what project it was on because then people could follow it up. And I remember we provided a specification uh, and a tender to build the um, substations for that district energy system. And I remember getting a call late at night actually from the project engineers telling me what the price needed to be and that if we were successful a certain amount of money needed to be uh, siphoned off and mailed to their account and uh, that call lasted that call lasted less than I think it was 45 seconds and I hung up and we, we, we pulled our, our tender you know so it I, I you know it does happen oh yeah it does but that's I, I can't See, you know, because like the pandemic right now, people are saying the doctors are forging death certificates to get uh, remuneration on COVID deaths. And I heard, I saw there was a program here recently. And so you get a lot of people talking about, yeah, 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 COVID, half the deaths are wrong deaths. And I don't know if it's half, but to get wide scale corruption in the medical industry where to have any kind of consequence, it would have to be a complete collapse. And I can't see that happening in engineering or in the medical field. Well, 
I mean, you know, anything is possible, mind you. Uh, but but I think that for 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 those of us who think this is our profession and who invest not only in our work, but in our volunteering to, to make the profession better, uh, yeah. we will not tolerate that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I go out with, with people at, at conferences and so on, and I pay for my own drinks, and I pay for my own food, because nobody gonna be ever able to say, well, you know, I took you out once. I don't care, like, I know you, that's fine. But as a public servant, I'm, you know, it's important to me that I pay my own things so that nobody can have ever uh, hanging things on me about that. Yeah. So it's just these little things that it's either you get it or you don't. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sort of 40 years into my career. I, I'm <laughs> old. But I've been on all sides. I've been client side. I've been a developer, a chart surveyor, I've been an engineer. I've seen it from all sides. And I've, the conclusion I've come to is the reason the results are so poor is all down to the owners and the clients because they let that happen to them. You get what you demand, right? I used to work for a company with a company called British Land in the UK. They got great jobs. Do you know why? Because they were ferocious. If you, if you did a good job, they paid you on time. They treated you well. If you screwed up, they were just like, it was like being mauled by a tiger. You know, you, one of the largest, I can't say what I mean, one of the largest construction companies in the world screwed one of our jobs up. They went off the tender list for five years. Every year, the managing director would come and kiss the ring, and I would say no. Right? So there was consequences for bad work. You know, you've yeah. got to be demanding and make sure they deliver. And yeah, yeah and, and, and for us, you know, um, when I was uh, a consultant, uh, we will have contractor and I say, you know what? We're not inviting you to the job showing. Yeah. That's it. You know, there are consequences to what you do and, and um, expect, you know, until, and, and, and unfortunately for me, I guess I, I'm, I'm a hard person because once you, you've done it once, it's going to take a heck long time for you to get back in my good grace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, when, the trust is gone. Right. So what am I supposed to do? Yeah. You know, I just want to give our listeners some like the, the scope of what we're talking about here. And, and, and if Chris Matthews, if, she ever, if he ever listens to this program, he's going to give me hell because I'm going to screw up the statistics. <laughs> but maybe, Lynch, maybe you, you know what they are. And maybe, Adam, you know what they are. But there's something like in, in North America, something like 70 percent of all of the buildings are under 25,000 square feet. Which means almost all of them are excluded from the requirement of having a professional engineer. And so you get a lot of buildings that are designed actually by non-professional people that don't have a secondary degree or training in the sciences. And so that sort of tells people that, you know, we're not talking about the high rises and the hospitals and, you know, these big institutions where there are professionals involved. And there's obviously some big stakes. We're talking about the strip malls and, you know, and there's just hundreds of thousands of these things that bad buildings, bad operation, poor indoor environments, people get sick, people get stressed. Uh, that's the kind of buildings we're talking about. And there's lots of them. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's uh, someone in your position is actually in a position to affect a change. I think with attitude, with procurement, with demands, hire yourself the meanest lawyer you can find, you know, it's just really, it's the only way. Someone said to me once, managing contractors is like having two angry Alsatians. You just got to exercise them real hard and keep them tired. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's like anything. I think it's, it's, it's one of the things where you, you have to start from the beginning and say, you know, these are the new standards. This is how we're yeah. going to look at things now. And, and, you know, nothing wrong with what my predecessors were doing. It's just that that's not the way I do things. So that was his way, and now this is my way. Get used to it, because this yeah. is what I would like to see, right? Um, obviously, yeah. it's all within the responsibility of the public money and so on. But I think it's really not uh, a, a service to, to the public if you are not using the highest standard you know you're not looking forward to things um you know you were talking about these strip malls uh, robert how many of these strip malls do we see just abandoned they're just littering the landscape 
because they are not being built correctly. They're not being operating yeah. correctly. What's yeah. the impact on the environment of these sort of abandoned buildings, right? Yeah. Um, so to me, that's, that's not saving any money there. No, and to some degree, there's an ethical challenge there, you know, because as stewards of Earth and the Earth resources, we, we really need to dig deep into our ethics here and ask ourselves, when we get clients that want to build these kinds of buildings, you know, how does that sit with us? Because, you know, even if you take an office, let's just take one office in one office tower in one city block and let's just say a third of that office is unoccupiable because of bad indoor environmental quality bad noise bad temperature whatever right yeah and you know so and let's say that that square footage is 250 dollars a square foot to build that particular area but because two-thirds of it is only can be used all of a sudden it's no longer 250 dollars a square foot it's like 200 or 268 or 270 dollars a square foot because the other third, you can't, you can't use it. But the resources were still harvested out of the earth, right? So you've got, you've got issues with you know, materials that we've taken out that can't be used. We've got capital tied up in spaces where the spaces can't be used. That's one office and one office tower in one city block. And then you grow that up. Well, how many offices spaces are like that in that building? How many buildings are on the city block, yeah. right? How many uh, blocks are in the city? How many cities in the state or the province? How many, in, and you just keep going and going and going. And all of a sudden you're looking back and you go, holy crap. Yeah. What have we done, you know, to the earth and to capital, the economics of this, by not putting our foot down and saying to the client and the architect, this is bullshit. Yeah. You know, like we really need to think about this. Yeah. Adaptive reuse is what you need, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, with the college, I started a program, it's called space optimization. <laughs> and I say, you know, before we build anything, first of all, <laughs> let's look how about how, how we use our space. Is this really uh, the most efficient way to use our space? Don't talk to me about new building right now, right? I mean, because just not, not just new building, it's the, the, the cost, the tying cost of building new but also the maintenance cost for the next 25 years, if you're lucky that it's gonna last yeah. 25 years. So um, I think that that's something that people have to look to. It's like, because there's this, this sort of idea that we need to build, we need to build new, we need to build more, we need to build bigger. And it's like, why? Yeah. <laughs> just, just why? The edifice complex will continue in just a moment. Can you find the drawing and supporting documents you need in less than a minute? Now you can with Echo. It's simple. Just type what you're looking for and press enter. Echo knows your building. Speak with a drawing specialist today. Ask about our special offer of painless onboarding plus six months free with Echo. Visit podcast.thedsoffer.com. That's podcast.thedsoffer.com. And now back to the show. Going forward, so let's say go forward a year, hopefully everyone's been vaccinated and the whole thing, the temperature's gone down several notches. Do you think there will be a retrofit program at your, you know, at your college to, to change ventilation systems or do you think it will quietly be forgotten? Oh, no. I mean, it is on, on its way right now. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I, have, uh, I have hired a consultant to do a low carbon feasibility study on our, um, all our ventilation system and recommendations been made. So we, uh, we uh, just hired uh, an engineering company to uh, do the design for replacement. Oh, so, excellent. yeah, so, uh, and, and I have told them, look, I want to have the ability to put MERV 13. If you're not gonna put, you know, I want the ability to do certain things. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm going to put MERV 13 all the time, but yeah. I want the ability to do so. I want you to give me slack. And I know that when I, they heard slack, they're like, oh my God, you want us to give you slack? Yes, because if the outdoor temperature go up by five degrees C, I want to be able to provide cooling, right? Yeah. So that's slack. Don't build to the, to yeah. the just enough. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, 
so uh, I, I'm, I'm building in, you know, uh, Slack and abilities to deal with, with the future, basically. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I mean that'd be a significant project, right? Because you've got multiple buildings. Uh. Yeah. Then, too, we're, we're getting on in the time, which is too bad, because I, I could talk with you all day. And I know Adam could, too. So I have, a, I have a question for you. So, okay. You guys had a business, you sell it, you're, you find a new job, you get, you get this opportunity to apply your academics and your practical skills onto a building. Now you're sitting there as the head honcho with all of this, with all, with all of these, yeah, you know, and, and you've got, and you got the wand. And so you have a vision for what you want to go and then COVID hits. Yep. So tell us, tell us, you know, you're, you show up day one with your new dress on and you got your brand new briefcase and like you're going to school for the first day. And, and then what happens? Tell, tell us that, that experience that you went through. Well, um, you, you know, I, I mean, over the years, my network is pretty large. So I, I sort of got a hint pretty early on in, in January that something was happening in Asia. So I, I went to my boss and, and bang on his door and say, we need to activate the pandemic program. And he looked at me and said, uh, what is it? I'm leaving for Mexico. See you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sort of, you know, mid-February. And I said, well, you know, I really, 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 really think that we should do this. So I'm going to activate it when you're away. I'm going to get everybody together and get everybody briefed so that if it's nothing, that's fine. But everybody will be aware. And so, um, and from there on, uh, I, I took over the, uh, the COVID um, committee, if you want, and, and uh, you know, having the experience of writing standards and procedure and so on, having the experience in hygiene and understanding the ventilation and indoor air quality. I, I miss COVID apparently at school now because they come to me and ask these questions. People were not understanding uh, even the, the rating on PPE, uh, what's the difference between different types of masks and so on. So, you know, we work very hard several months to make sure that everything is in place before getting people back. So for me, the, 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 the pandemic has been extremely busy for that. Plus I have projects going on that I wanted to do. Plus I have operation and maintenance. So, you know, all of that get carried in the background in parallel with this whole COVID thing. But to me, COVID, it's just a blip in things, right? I mean, again, yeah. going back to the th long-term thinking, okay, it's a blip, we learn from it, and that was great, and we managed okay, and then now what, right? So I'm already in recovery mode, even if we're still in, in Ontario, you know, in confinement and so on. Yes, but we have put in place procedure, we know they're working, that's fine, and then I kind of give it to somebody else, you keep track of this now. Um, and yeah. I think that owning a business teach you that, Robert, right? I mean, yep. you, you sort yeah. out something and then you give it to somebody else to do and you move on to look at the next thing. So I'm in the next thing. I'm in recovery right now. So I'm looking at green recovery. I'm looking at um, the financial uh, money that might, might be coming from the feds in terms of green recovery. What can we do to accelerate that? How yeah. do we bring the campus to uh, low carbon 2030? Uh, what is it that I'm doing? And, you know, so so the COVID is kind of behind me at this point because, you know, we, we, wow. we kind of control it with the now college and it's good. So that's, that's, that's where I am now. That's really refreshing because <laughs> you, you know, you for you, it's been a blip because A, you had the knowledge, you were prepared for it to happen, you were able to execute, and then you can move on. That's mm -hmm. a difference that between you and so blip versus bam. <laughs> because anybody that didn't, wasn't educated, wasn't prepared, yeah. didn't have a solution or a strategy, to them, this is like a crisis. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so to hear that coming from you, an engineer, by the way, just had to, you know, people need to listen to that. That wasn't, that wasn't a lawyer that was yeah. prepared. Well, there, we had, there were some good lawyers actually out there, but. <laughs> You know, that's why it was a bullet. <laughs> you know, honestly, Robert, I that's have to good. learn like everybody else, right? I mean, it was new. So I learned. I learned really quickly. I read everything I could read. I talked to people. I listened to people from ASHRAE, 
from different organizations. Mind you, the real people, not, you know, the lunatics. Uh, you know, I'm listening to the National <laughs> Academy of Science. I'm listening, and, and because of all the volunteering, I kind of knew who I should be listening to. You know, yep. the industrial hygiene yeah. people, the National Academy of Science people, actually. No <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So you listen to all these people and, and eventually you see the same pattern. You know, yeah, they're saying the same thing. So, yeah. okay. So if they're all saying the same thing, you know, that you can take that little piece away and say, okay, I think th this is okay. I can go and use that piece. You know, I, I can I can rely on that information and go and use it. Um, yeah, the, the French, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but I think for me, it really, it, it was really, as I say, it, it's a blip because right now I'm like, okay, well, that's done. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, it's uh, there's other things that needs to be done and Let's move it's, on. You know, well, yeah. that, that is, uh, I'd, I'd like all our listeners to take that on board. For me, that's the money yeah. shot. COVID yeah, is awesome. put a blip in a building's life, right? That yeah. is so true. So, you know, this problem comes, we deal with it the best we can. Yeah. We adapt, we move on, and we look forward, right, to reducing yeah. energy, you know, get into a low carbon environment. But the, there's going to be two types of approaches and move ons. There's going to be those that like went through this being punched in the head continuously and not doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. And then they're going to go back to business as usual. Yeah. And then there's going to be people who dealt with it, took a lesson and moved on and got better. Right. Yeah. That's really a choice. Everybody is really making right now. Yeah. Are you going to learn from this, adapt and move on well and be better? Or are yeah. you just going to hold your breath, take your punches and then go back to business as normal? Right. Yeah. That's the choice. Yeah, and the difference in that, I think, Adam, is have you learned? So yeah. did you listen to all what these people were saying about filtration, about ventilation, about this, about that? If you haven't learned, you're going to get punched in the head every time, and you're going to, the next crisis, you're going to repeat the same thing. Yeah. Look, you, you, you hit one of my triggers there. Every time I see someone newly discovering MERV 13, UV, and DOAS, it, I feel like screaming, for God's sake, it's been around forever. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? Filtration's been around for, you know, UV light's been around for a yeah. long time. What? Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I, I hear this all the time, this rotating things where people come back and say, what about big out? What do you mean big out? Big out, it's like 20 years ago. You're behind here. It's not new. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, if you've been in the business long enough, you're starting to see things being recycled, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you see that new idea come up every 20 years. <laughs> so, hey, Adam, us, us old folks, are we recyclable? Will we, <laughs> will I, we hope find so. it? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, I you don't want to recycle recycled. my brain. <laughs> My brain needs to go into a waste dump. <laughs> All things in that our business, funny. you can take back to Monty Python, the life of Brian. What have the Romans ever done for us? Well, plumbing, <laughs> radiant heating, you know, aqueducts, yeah. <laughs> sanitation. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing new in the world. Everything's 2,000 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some some of their stuff is still holding. Can we say the yeah. same about our buildings? Mm. Oh, I, I gave a, good, a presentation uh, once about the benefits of radiant heating, and someone who was educated, as you know, better said, "This new technology is too dangerous. It's unproven." And my next slide was a Roman ruin with radiant heating. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, sure, you know. yeah. That's uh, nice, man. Wow. So look, we're so, coming up on time here um we do have a, we'd like to finish on some quick fire questions if that's okay one sure. from each of us um yeah i'll go first if you want so go ahead there's a father of two daughters one of them an engineer yeah. i love i love it when i see uh women in sort of like boss jobs is that the way to put it as my as my daughter calls it i want to be boss baby here <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you know what What's your advice to people, uh, young, young women, young undergraduates, thinking about STEM and leadership roles? What advice would you give them based on your experience? It takes time. Yeah, it right. takes time. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it takes time to figure out what you really like to do. 
and to be really good at what you're doing. Uh, it, it, you have to work at it. You just have to work at it. Like I didn't get to where I am by not volunteering, by not listening to people, by not learning. You know, it's all work. It's work to get to, to where you are. And, uh, and, and you have to keep learning and you have to keep looking. You don't have to be a lot ahead of people. You just have to be a little bit ahead of people. And that's what I always say running my own business, right? I don't need to be a light year ahead of my competitor. I just need to be a little bit ahead of my competitor. And that's it. That's all what it takes. It's like the bear attack. Just run faster than the other guy. You're all good. Just, yes, just slightly <laughs> faster. Just slightly faster. You know, I have so many questions that I, and some of them have, but I think the question that Adam asked is it was a really good question. I loved your answer. Um, I do want to leave our audience, those that may be running universities or colleges, educational facilities with some of your last words of advice. And that's just take a hypothetical situation where maybe someone says, you know, you got a call, Lanchi, we hear you have it under control. Come on out to our college and take a look at what we're doing because we're not doing things well. What would you say to them? What's your advice I to those? You know, I'd be there anytime because I think that as part of your profession is to teach the next generation and to help your peers. And um, I don't think that uh, it's confined to my institution or my, uh, my province or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like a fellowship, the engineering fellowship. You know, it's, it's a responsibility that you have to, 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 to give the knowledge. And, and that's why I think volunteering is my way of giving, of giving back the knowledge, right? Sitting on these endless standard writing <laughs> and hopefully make the profession a little bit better, right? By having put things down in standards, having guidelines, having procedure is to guide people and say, you know what? This is how you should be thinking of doing this. This is what we've done before. So if you call me and say, come out and help us sort these things out, I'd be more than happy to do. And I will do it in my own time. You know, it doesn't even have to be the college time. Because I think that that's a responsibility that I have. You know, other yeah. people have helped me get to where I am. I need to help other people get to where they are. I love that answer. I, you know, I was in Winnipeg for a building, uh, a building uh, conference. And Professor Terry Blokes, I think is her name, she's a, a professor of architecture at University of Waterloo, and she was up there talking about research work and research behind paid walls. And her and 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 it was great because she said, We're trying to save the world, make your F and stuff free. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and I'll never forget that because it's like you're, like you're saying, we have an obligation to pass the information on and the knowledge, what we've learned, so that people don't make mistakes or they, fa they facilitate whatever it is that they need to do. And if there's someone like ourselves around that we can share that knowledge, we need to share it. It's, yeah. it's so valuable. I, I love these questions. Um, why don't you, every time I talk to you, I get so passionate and enthusiastic. It's just, you know. <laughs> well, good. Well, that's, that's hopefully, you know. Invite me back some other time. We will, we will. Well, you know, every time, I, every time I see you and Dawn at the conferences, and I always, I always enjoy. I mean, we, we never get the top talk long because we're both got a million things to do at the at our schedules. Um, but maybe next time we'll get you and Dawn on, and you guys can tell us what it was like to be a husband wife team uh, during your <laughs> your years. Well, and, he's and, laughing in the back. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> Well, you know what, I mean, but, and, and I know also joking aside, there's a lot that, that couples, you know, young couples that have come together that want to run a home-based business or they want to run a partnership and they want to grow the business. Things that, and you know, we've all been Adam's uh, business. I've been in business. You've been in business. We have, other than our, just our academic and our practical skills, there is the business side of it. And we yeah. need to share that as well. And part of that is relationships, your own yeah. relationships with your partners, but also the relationships that you have with people, the yeah. soft skills. And I think we, that would be a great, maybe Adam, maybe that's, we've been talking for a long time about doing a soft skill uh, interview. Yeah, that's a good idea. Actually. I like that. 
Soft yeah. skills are the difference maker, right? Yeah. yeah. You need to talk with Don for that. I have no soft skill. <laughs> Engineers yeah. are notoriously for notorious for having terrible soft skills. Right? There you go. That's why architects get all the glory. That's right. Hey, that bothers me. Architects get the glory. You never hear about the engineer, do you? No. So anyway, maybe I'm going to change that one day. <laughs> anyway, just thank you very much for coming on. It was a great interview. Really enjoyed yeah. talking to you. Very inspirational. I love that engineering is a fellowship. That is so true. Yeah. Send the elevator down and teach the next generation, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Take care, both of you. The Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. Adam, it's time to thank some people who are on our side. Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software. Blue Rhythm is the commissioning software I've been looking for. Most projects I consult on suffer from poor information and document management. Frankly, it's just chaos out there. Blue Rhythm removes this chaos. It is a secure, always available cloud solution designed to work on any computer, tablet, or smartphone. Their Android and iOS apps allow seamless transition between online and offline work. But what I like most about Blue Rhythm is their painless and fast onboarding process. Their team will bring all your existing forms and checklists into Blue Rhythm for you, or you can use or adapt their pre-built, pre-functional, and functional performance test sheet templates. But it's more than that. It enables collaboration, automation, and easy planning and project management for all your projects. Blue Rhythm provides amazing support from a team that really understands your industry. To find out more, go to bluerhythm.com or call country code plus one, 612-460-8305. Also, you can hear from Blue Rhythm President Andy Martin on episode 26 of the Edifice Complex podcast. Robert, Robert, we there yet? I'm bored. <laughs> Adam, I know it's hard to believe, but the future has finally arrived in Canada. How's that then? Well, smart remote building and equipment management is now available from Sensor Suite. Go on. Sensor Suite, yep. They're an innovator in smart building technology. We like them. They can monitor, control, and optimize anything in your building, saving you time and energy. You mean Sensor Suite are moving Canadian buildings into the 21st century? Yeah, I know, another hard thing to believe, but they're doing it and they're saving owners money with efficiency gains. Okay, I'm in. How do I find out more? Got to go to sensorsuite.com or call 1-855-773-6767 and also check out the July 2020 episode of the NFS Complex podcast and listen to Sensor Suite CEO Glenn Spry. And now, back to the show. How could you not get pumped up about these conversations that we had with uh, Lanchi. I mean, I, I mean, I always do whenever I see them because they're just, they love what they do. And she is just a firecracker. You know, she's, I just, I love her focus, but you know, she, she travels through life uh, with, with the logical mind of the engineer, but she expands and contracts to take in what is around her and she uses it to her, understanding so that she can keep moving forward she you know I, and i love when people do that yeah she she looks like she takes no prisoners you know what i mean bayonet the wounded moving on <laughs> <laughs> and i love that yeah. whenever we we interview people i see myself i always wind up thinking god i wish that person was one of my professors or lecturers at college you know that'd have been yeah. great Looking like i really got something from that you know and this yeah. is this is one of my pet peeves some of the people, a lot of the people we interview would make great practitioner teachers, like clinical yeah. professors, you know? Right, yeah. Go in and say, look, I know you've got the fundamentals locked down, but I'm telling you, this is how, we, this is how <laughs> it's done, right? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> yeah. People, they're not, that is one of the fundamental flaws in the higher education system. Yes, you need the fundamentals, but you also need the practitioner side. And any applied business like ours, the applied engineering we do, you know, that is what you need. You need to someone come in and not tell war stories, but say that this is practically how you do it. You yeah. take these fundamentals and you apply them this way, and this is how you get that, you know. <laughs> that, yeah. None of that really happens unless you're in a sort of vocational school. That's why I'm yeah. a big fan of vocational schools as a foundation, because you come out knowing which way around something goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, 
I mean, affectionately, you know, you're known as Yoda because you have this like, mm, you know, knowledge bank of yours and, and have the power. But, you know, Lan Chi also has this attitude, you know, not try do, you know, I was Yoda, right? Not try do. And, and uh, you know, no excuses, just this is it. This is how we solve it. Get it done and then move on. And I, you know, that's... Jill, he's the first person I've heard who's really gone, <clears throat> yeah, COVID, I'm over it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a blip. It's put a blip in the life of a building. <laughs> that is so profound at so many levels, right? Yeah, it really is. And it's a just, a, like I said, I got excited about that because uh, it was the fact that she saw it coming yeah. early on. Yeah. She prepared her mind to study what was necessary to, 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 to react. Yeah. She developed the strategies and supportive tactics to make it, to be able to pull the trigger and then said, okay, here, yeah. Now, yeah. next. <laughs> What's not to like about that? I mean, that's the way everything, that's the way it should have been run. And you know, they didn't run and hide. They weren't freaking out and you know, they, it was good. I, yeah. You know what? I like that. Leadership takes many forms, and that was a classic leadership position and posture that was taken yeah. there. Yeah, it sure was. 99 people out of 100 there would have sat back and let that whole thing roll over them. Yeah. So you saw, I say to you, say people who used to work for me, you, know, you can be a leader in anything you do, right? It, it, it's not about having the suit, the haircut, and the watch, and standing up and doing the town hall meeting. It's about fo leaning forward. I hate saying leaning in, it's such a woke thing, but leaning <laughs> forward, you know, taking, seeing what's coming and preparing yourself. That is leadership yeah. at any level, in any field. You know, so I love that. So that was one of the things I took away from interviewing her is that she's a leader. Yeah, totally. You know, as well as being inspirational and overcoming and learning French and moving from another country and all that stuff. You know, yeah. it's called that Tuesday. I just, <laughs> I just, I'm looking at my notes, and, you know, they talked about um, Slack. Uh, and we, in, in our, in my world, we would call that designing for failure. Um, yeah. You know, that you can design things the most perfectly the way that you can, but at some point, something might happen where you need some wiggle room. Yep. And I love that philosophy, you know, that, okay, we want you to design our system so that we can put in, you know, the MERV 13 filters or whatever it is else that they're going to do in the event that we need it, we have capacity to deal, to deal with. But we may not, you know. Um, that's a really good philosophy to have um, in the design of mechanical systems. That, that's where... An owner, and she represents the owner because she is the client, right? She's yeah. the head of the college and the physical plant department, right? So <clears throat> having a owner who understands or, ha or hires people that understand um, buildings and the engineering that goes in them is a unfair advantage, right? Because yeah. by having her represent them and be involved in the procurement and setting the policy and the standards and writing the requirements for that, that's being written by someone who understands the benefit of Slack, the benefit of building a bit of spare capacity here and, you know, going dedicated outside air or understand the benefit of a certain filtration system. Because one of the big problems right. is a lot of people to procure and even appoint design teams. You know, most, to be fair to most engineers and design teams, they're, they're so poorly um, briefed about what they want Someone goes, oh, yeah, give me a leak gold college building so I can put my name on it. Yeah, that's great. Good luck with that. You, know? <laughs> you need right. a design brief. You know, these are the things that matter to me. These are the conditions I want. This, I'm involved in maintaining this building for 25 years. I don't want to see this, this, and this piece of rubbish equipment on there. Don't put it in. You know, that's yeah. really, if you're a 25-year life cycle person, you have to write the best requirements document ever or your design team are gonna just pump and dump you know yeah totally 
Someone once said to me, there's two things that a procurement agent should never be able to buy ever. One is toilet paper and the other one is HVAC systems. <laughs> <laughs> that is so <not> true. <laughs> yeah, that right. is actually true. We got to finish on that, man. That is a great <laughs> Yeah, that is true. That is true, man. Because again, consequences, right? This is, I understand why procurement is a thing. But the problem yeah. is when you get people procuring services and higher level engineering, not understanding what they are, and most importantly, not suffering the consequences for their choice. Yeah, you know, right. I buy shitty toilet paper because it ain't my finger that's going through it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's and that is one of the, actually the flaws that we have in our industry is that we have people designing and building buildings that never have to occupy them. Yep. There's no the consequent the all the incentives are completely misaligned. Yeah, totally. It's a miracle that anything gets built that stands up, quite frankly, because the incentive structures are so misaligned, and the consequences are so poor. You know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's actually fascinates me that things actually get done in the end. You know, I'm 40 yeah. years in, I can still walk around a site and think. How is this ever going to get done on time? You know, and then somehow it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, four years in, I still walk around with my jaw on the floor. Is what you should take away from this sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Anyway, man, we better wrap up. That was great. I I found her very very inspirational, man. That's a great story. Yeah, Adam. Again, you know, I really am enjoying this journey that we're on, getting to talk to some really great people and. You know, I don't know how long, maybe we'll be here 20 years from now doing the same thing or maybe five years. I don't know how long this thing is going to last, this continuing on, but I am really grateful for it. No, listen, our mission is there are great people out there. We just got to bring them out and show them to other people so other people yeah, know that's, that they're right? That's, that's our job, man. Yeah, that's it. It's very simple. Good work <laughs> should be uh, good people should be known about, right? Period. That's, that's right. Very yeah. simple. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. See you next time.